What's going on? This is episode 115 of the Perspective Podcast. If you are creative and you're currently struggling with things like your mental health, your physical health, or maybe you just have a hard time with freelancing and pricing in general, or most importantly, if you're stuck in a negative mindset, then my friend, today's episode was made for you. At the end of each episode, I share a listener of the week, so stick around to the end to figure out how you can get a shout out on a future episode in the show notes as well as in the newsletter. The Perspective Podcast is fuel for your mind and creative grind. Each week, my guests and I provide the skills for thinking bigger, overcoming adversity, and making an impact with your work. Welcome. Thanks for joining me with this experiment of pursuing video for my first time. This is by far one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever done. This is harder than public speaking or getting started in the podcast anyway. So bear with me as you know, I, I tame this new beast of video and really push my understanding of how to deliver the best content on this platform moving forward. It's going to be a slow work in progress, but guarantee I'm always going to be pushing the quality with the help of people like Colton Bacher. So today, I want to start with a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, comparison is the thief of joy. And for me, I live a lot of my life comparing myself to other people, you know, whether I wanted to uh, have the same kind of following this other person has, the same kind of client projects, the same looks, the same body, the same financial situation. You know, I wanted all of this stuff and comparison robbed me of a lot of joy for the majority of my life. I would say easily the first 28 years I've been lost in, compar uh, lost in comparison to a lot of people. And I, I've learned that we're kind of all on our own paths, at our own race, at our own destination, at our own timing. And today's guest is someone that absolutely incredibly blows my mind about how much he's accomplished by the age of 25. And he's been someone I've been really guilty of comparing myself to often. But, you know, I'm getting over that. I, I'm doing my own thing with my own path, with my own audience, my own voice, and my own message. And that's what's dope. So today's guest, he's done work with juggernauts like Target, Netflix, Starbucks, Adobe, Facebook, just to name a few. What's going on, PC family? I'm sitting here with the homie Scott Beersack of You Bring Fire. Welcome to the Perspective Podcast, my dude. What's going on? <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. Good to be here. Yeah. What's, what's up with you today? What's the weather like in Arizona? Are you in Phoenix still? I'm in Phoenix still. Right now, it actually is pretty cloudy and overcast, which is very uncommon for Phoenix. Um, but it's been kind of chilly, like a colder year than normal. Normally, it's at least in the 50s or 60s or so. And like last week, it was the low was in the 30s, and I was freezing my butt off. And I know everybody on the East Coast, like 30 degrees is nothing. But, I'll take it. You know, for Phoenix, that's freaking cold, man. It's like 5, 10 degrees here right now in Iowa. Uh, it's, a, it's a warm 5 degrees. <laughs> Oh, hell no, man. That's way too cold. Way too cold. Well, I've been meaning to get you on this show for a long time now. So for those who don't know, give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself. Okay. And you're probably tired of doing this, but please just tell people what You Bring Fire even means. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I like to say that I am an illustrator and a designer because illustration sort of encompasses everything that I do from, uh, of course, lettering, illustration itself, um, murals, uh, calligraphy, um, type. yeah, pretty much everything type related as well as illustration is, is generally what I do for clients. And so I have a broad spectrum of sort of skill sets, but mostly focused within typography. Um, and then as for you bring fire, uh, that spawned from a, a band that I used to listen to when I was, I think I was probably in middle school. Um, it's a band called ivory line and they're like, it's so funny to say this, but they're they're like a Christian rock band, and I am uh, not religious whatsoever. Uh, but for some reason, during middle school, I was really into Christian rock music. You know, I was <laughs> I was listening to like Hawk was Nelson, like, was like Switchfoot uh, or anything. Yeah, Switchfoot for sure. And then Ivory Line was one of my like my go to bands, and they have this song that's titled "You Bring Fire." Um, and at the time, you know, I was pretty big on on uh, on Tumblr when that was still a thing. I'm sure it's still a thing now, but I think it's slowly dying. Uh, but I use that as my, my Tumblr username because the, the song itself from Ivory Line really spoke to me at the time. Um, and it, you know, it really resonated with what I was going through um, during that point in my, in my life. And I sort of just like held on to it up until 
you know, till this day. And I, I don't have any, or I don't foresee sort of replacing that. I think it's almost like a part of who I am at this point. For sure. And you went to Arizona State, right? Uh, for college, yes. I yes. went to ASU for four years, yeah. So when did you, like, get obsessed with the whole type aspect of things in life? Did you always have a thing for, like, lettering and logos growing up? Or did you really find your groove within college? Or did you kind of yeah. already know what you wanted to do, and then you just, like, amplified it then? Right. Well, so starting out in high school, I actually – well, even before high school, I actually started taking art class, you know, from – first grade up until I graduated high school. So I was actually more, more on the art route. Um, like fine then, arts? Yeah, painting like fine arts. So I was painting a lot. I was actually doing a lot of painting, um, sculptural stuff, like anything fine art related. I was yeah. doing that. But then junior year is when um, my, my high school offered a graphic design class. And that's when I was just like, oh, if, if I could do art, I could do design. And, you know, I, I assumed it would be an easy A. But uh, Little did I know there are two different worlds. So, um, but taking that further, you know, I got very interested in design in high school and my teacher went through the ASU design program and that's sort of what led me to, you know, go to ASU and focus more on design because sadly, you know, there is that sort of stigma that, um, artists are starving artists. Starving you know, even artists. Though, it's a hobby. And how do you make money from it? You know? Right. Even though I don't agree with that whatsoever, but at the time, you know, of course my parents and many others were sort of, um, almost instilling this sense of fear, you know, that makes you wonder like, should I go into art? So anyway, that's why, that, that's why most of us go into design because I of know. that stereotype. <laughs> yeah. being fed. Yep. It's so sad, but you know, that's what ended up happening. And obviously, you know, I have no, I have no regrets. I enjoyed being a designer. Um, and I still get to use that, that art aspect in my everyday design life. And so, um, so yeah, so that's how I got into, um, the Arizona state design program and then continuing further. My, my freshman year is when I was like sort of thrown into at least understanding anything about typography. Cause we had to paint, um, our letter forms. We had to, <laughs> uh, to, to try and gain an understanding of how an H is made or how an E is made, um, we had to paint them all by hand to perfection. Um, you know, if you were a millimeter or two millimeters off, you had to essentially redo it or repaint it. Um, so we work back and forth with white and black placa. If you've ever used placa, it's kind of just like this clay based. I think it's a clay based paint because it's it's very it's very like a thick paint, and you had to add water to it and mix it up. And anyway. Uh, so that's how I got into typography. We we had like that sort of intro class, and I was very interested in in like the sort of construction aspect of it. And then uh, you know, getting into uh, my later years in college, like uh, sophomore and junior year, um, I was really sort of, I guess, bogged down by a lot of the the courses and the classes that I was taking because they were so strict. Um, and so rooted within Swiss design. And if you've seen my work, it is very far from Swiss it's design. not even close. Uh, and I think that's why is because I, I, I hate Swiss design, uh, maybe because of the program, but maybe it's also steered me in a way that, you know, I know, I know what I like and what I don't like. Um, and so that's when I sort of experimented with lettering more and more because I needed this sort of, this sort of outlet to still create something um, on my own terms and enjoy it and enjoy the process and all that stuff. And so, you know, I slowly started to get more and more into, into lettering. And that's when I forced myself to do that project like, 65. What? Yeah, exactly. So when you started this, what year would this have been just so people can kind of calculate it? Cause we're, you're a couple years younger than me, but I think yeah. we, both, we both started Instagram somewhat at the same time. I think you got a little bit more of a jump on than it than I did. Yeah, I want to say, like, what, 2012, 2013, maybe? See, uh, I got into Instagram at, like, 2013, hardcore lettering in 2014. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I first started out, like, I, I made an Instagram pretty late into the game compared to a lot of my friends, you know? Um, Instagram at that point was probably, I don't know, maybe maybe four or five years old, at least getting big at four or five years old. Um, and so it was still relatively new. And, um, you know, I just looked at Instagram as a way to sort of share the work that I was doing 
um, in a new way rather than, you know, because a lot of my friends, of course, are taking photos of their food, food. of their pets, <laughs> of, you know, whatever, whatever they fancy they were posting on Instagram. And I was trying to look at it as more of a, you know, as a portfolio. So what made you start that letter in 365? Like, what was the thing that you're like, this is what I'm going to do? Because now there's all these challenges of the 365 challenge, but it sounds like you were one of the OGs in doing it. I, I'd like to think so, but I don't know for sure if I, if I truly was. Um, I wanted to do it mostly because, I, like I said, I needed a challenge. I needed something to, to creatively push me, but then to also see what I'm capable of. You know, it was kind of just a... a a uh, challenge to to see to see what I was capable of, essentially, yeah. Um, and I forced myself to, of course, create something every single day for an entire year, and that was very difficult, especially when there's times where, of course, there's many days you don't want to do it. There's some days where you have other things to do. Of course, going through school, I had an immense amount of of classwork, but then I also had um, my full time or part time job at, at the advertising agency that I was working at. And so it was, a, it was a constant juggle of balancing all of that and, um, you know, just having that, that uh, social aspect of posting it on Instagram and then having that immediate feedback was obviously a great sort of motivator because people were expecting something. People knew, oh, what is, you know, something's going to be posted tomorrow. The consistency there. People notice consistency. Right. And I think that's sort of how my following slowly started to build up especially back then when instagram was such a baby it was so much easier to to get noticed and to get your work out there um whereas now it's a very different story of course so that know. first wave of like lettering popularity started taking over right exactly and that was that was when lettering was slowly making a i guess a comeback if come back yep um and now it's like i would say it's pretty mainstream i feel like there's a massive amount of people doing it now which is great saturated um, it's very saturated, so it is much harder to stand out from the rest. But you know, it's just again, it comes down to, you know, what what's something new you can offer. How, again, maybe it's consistency. Um, there's a whole slew of things to take into account, along with trying to battle the the algorithm. <laughs> exactly, or trying to do and vomit what everybody else is doing. Like, how can you stand yeah. out? <laughs> I know, man. It's tough. It's tough. What um what was probably like the biggest thing that the 365 challenge brung you towards next you know what were the biggest takeaways and how did that totally blow up your i guess your young career right at that point uh you know when i finished the challenge um yeah you know it's probably like what 20 it might have been like the start of 2014 of course because i think i started january 1st um 2013 i could be wrong on all these dates but let's just use those <laughs> uh so 2014 was when i think i was a I might have been a junior in in college. So, you know, it sort of set up a nice um, trajectory in the freelance world. Like I was I was doing freelance projects um, throughout the 365 uh, project that I gave myself. And then, of course, uh, clients and companies were seeing this work that I was doing. Um, and one of my major, you know, huge first gigs that I got when I was... Um, I think I was a sophomore or maybe an early junior at the time uh, was with TGI Fridays. And that's when I knew I was like, OK, I can do this um, full time if I truly wanted to or at least continue to do this so that, you know, I can work with, you know, huge um, advertising agencies or bigger companies similar to TGI Fridays because that was a really great paying gig, especially being a student. I was like, damn, I could pay off my student loans in a Wild. couple a couple and more I, gigs. And I definitely want to talk about how you were able to pay off the student loans later. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally down to talk about that. Okay, that was crazy. So, so yeah, man. I mean, it was just like, I, I feel like it was the right place at the right time, honestly. And everything just sort of aligned. The stars aligned. And and that's when I knew, you know, even before before I did uh, the Project 365, I thought to myself, okay, I'll just, I'll be that guy that's living and working in, living, <laughs> working in a studio uh, or, or an agency living um, under I, your art easel <laughs> right so like i i just assumed that i would be that guy that you know sort of does that for life but then when i got that tgi fridays project i was like okay maybe i could do freelance and maybe i could be my own boss and it it just never sort of occurred to me until tgi fridays or this advertising agency that gave me the the project with tgi fridays um you know once they gave me that opportunity that's when this sort of ball started rolling and i was like damn i i think i could do this so yeah, it's pretty yeah. it's pretty exciting 
that's wild that a 365 personal project can not only unlock consistency time management but confidence in your work and exactly. put yourself get yourself consistently in front of people to remind people you exist did they find you through instagram then yeah everything's through instagram at that point i feel like social media was the wild west because i shortly after that tgi fridays project there was the girl skateboards project that i also got through behance of all places like all you had to do was hashtag your work and i was like sure why not hashtag my work and then you know a couple weeks later i remember waking up uh, at 6 a.m. as I normally do. And I checked my email and I saw I got an email from somebody from Adobe and Girl Skateboards that wanted to work with me um, on this Girl Skateboards project. So it's just, it's freaking nuts, man. It's nuts. Your story definitely isn't normal. By I'd anything. like to think that, yeah. It's definitely <laughs> not normal. Um, so have you, did when you graduated, have you just been full-time freelance? ever since or did you have a job somewhere right so when i when i graduated uh at that point i still had my my gig at zion and zion which was the advertising agency that i was working at um and i knew that i was going to go through the type of cooper program um because i knew explain what that is too for people who don't know right so the type of cooper program is a uh, postgraduate certificate program in new york city and now they have one in san francisco um, at the time, the San Francisco one didn't exist. So that's why I was like, okay, I'm moving to New York. Um, and so I knew I was going to that program. And I wanted the stability, of course, of having a job so that I could pay for, you know, I, we're moving to New York City. I had no idea what to expect. I, I, I know everybody said, you know, how expensive the rent was. And of course, the cost of living and everything is so much more. So I thought, okay, I should probably have a full-time job or at least a steady flow of income. So that's when I applied at Stranger and Stranger. And uh, I got an internship there for, um, it was about three months. The internship lasted three months, but then, you know, they were, I feel like they were about to offer me a, you know, a full-time position because we had talks about it. But at that point, it was very hard for me to, to manage um, the Stranger and Stranger aspect along with the type type of Cooper schedule. So both schedules, it just didn't work out. So I had to make the choice. Do I do, you know, it was one or the other. And so since I made the move to New York um, for the, the type of Cooper program specifically, I feel like the choice was kind of obvious. I knew I needed to focus more on school. And so that was kind of like my unintentional jump into full-time freelance. I was like, well, I, I don't want to go searching for another job right now. So the freelance works hopefully will pay off and you know i've been freelancing ever since so it's been about At what age was you uh let's see i'm 25 now <laughs> i think i was 22 21 or 22 and it's funny because you're 25 so this this is something I'm, I'm very open and honest about you were actually one of the people i compared myself to the most and beat myself up about because in my mind i got such a late start <laughs> I fucked around a lot. That's okay, I, man. I, I know, but at the time, like it's taken me a long time to accept that we're all on these different paths. Right, going, yeah. You know, we start our, our marathon at a different speed. We go at different speeds. We're all at different destinations. And it took me a long time to understand, like, I, it's okay what I'm doing. You know, what I'm right. doing is for me. Exactly. And a lot of people might be looking and listening right now and be like, holy shit, he's done all this for 25. And in the intro, I'll name all these massive brands you've worked with. But it's when you hear this stuff, just know that everybody's path is different. You know, everybody's don't get lost path. in yeah, comparison because yeah. you have a story that is easily to fall victim to comparison to. Right, right. But at this, and every, but at this, sorry, go on. I was just going to say everybody's um, sort of life events and motivations and inspirations and all those things sort of lead you into that trajectory. So not everybody, it's okay to not have the right path because sometimes you get that motivation or you get that inspiration later in life or maybe you don't know what you're doing at first because you you know meandered into a career doing uh music instead of design or wh whatever that thing may be it's okay because as long as you end up in that point you know in the nearby future or later on down the road you know you get there when you get there and that's all that matters really and i and i thought like i needed to be successful and to be well known and to have a thriving career, I needed to take on, you know, put myself in a position to take on lots of freelance and land these big clients. And once I stopped 
you know, pursuing that and accepting what I'm doing, I realized, hey, maybe that's actually not the route I want to take. And maybe building right. the podcast and go the coaching route. That's what, you know, sparks my lights my spirit up more. So it's funny once I stopped caring so much about what yeah. someone like you or everyone else was doing, I ended up finding that I'm really happy doing this, what I do right now. And if exactly, freelance man. comes, if it's hell yes, I'll take it on. If it's not, it's not a big deal. There you go. Yeah, man. And everybody's form of success is completely different too. So um, you know, my form of success is obviously very different from yours. Like you said, you want to get into the the podcasting stuff and like that. I have no interest in that, but I think that's wonderful that you do. And I think um, that's another thing to be aware of as well is that we're not all on the same page in form of in in terms of success and what you deem um, successful, quote unquote successful. So, um, you know, take that with a grain of salt as well. Make your own definition of what success looks like to you exactly. for sure. Instead of yeah. trying to mimic what success is for someone else. That right. was that was a very big mental roadblock because I grew up differently. I didn't have this mindset that you were kind of, you know, adopted from your mom. Which exactly. So we'll <laughs> yeah. talk to you later. I didn't have that. And, you know, living life thinking in abundance instead of living out of lack that mm -hmm. and feeling like the world was against me like that. That took me a while to crack. And once I got through it, it's like, holy shit, like all this abundant opportunities start coming my way. And there you go. I know. But out. it's it's amazing. And you've yeah. out a lot with that. But um, freelance, full time freelance, if people are aiming for that, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Like I, I've, you and I have talked plenty of times of you looking for work or putting yourself out there. Hey, I'm available. Yeah. So what are like some of the tougher times? And then how does a typical uh, a typical day of freelance look for you? Because you're awesome with your time management coming out of college. You know, so are you a very structured, <laughs> are you a very yeah. structured person? Very, very structured. Uh, you know, being in college, that's when I had my part-time job. That was from 6 a.m. They let me come in early, <laughs> luckily. So I, I went in from 6 a.m. to about 1 p.m. From 1 p.m. to about 4 was when I had my class. Um, and then from 4 p.m. to, you know, maybe 7 or so is when I'm doing my class work, like my, my homework. And then 7 p.m. onward is generally when I was doing my freelance work. And then I was doing that every day for like three years. And of course, it took a huge toll on me. Like I was I was burning it at both ends for way too long. And of course, it all came to a screeching halt, you know, towards the end of my senior year, even junior year. I was ready to drop out of school junior year. I had, many, out. I had many talks with my teachers. They could tell that I was frustrated and just pissed off all the time. <laughs> Um, cause I was just burned out, you know, and I had to just continually push myself through it. And I ended up obviously graduating too, because I knew, you know, I already put myself through three years of that, you know, I, I thought, okay, I can suck it up for one more. Um, and so that, that was a, a horrible setup to everything else, but you know, it was a great experience at the same time because I learned a lot, um, along the way. And I learned a lot about myself and what I like, what I don't like. Um, and then of course to how to manage my time more effectively. Um, and, uh, yeah. And what was your, what was the second question? Well, how, first let's talk about how do you manage your time? Cause a I'll lot of people, yeah. the main thing, main question, the main struggle I always get is how do you make time to focus on grinding, you know, doing the thing that whether it's full-time freelance or just like a side passion yeah. project hustle outside the day job, what's That's that tough. look like for you? Do for you me, have like, a, do you use like a sauna, a task program? Do you plan everything? Uh, a week advance you plan the night before your daily attack no i mean it's funny a lot of people ask me this question and for me i guess for me it's writing it down like i have a i have just a notebook um and like i used to have notes a or something or a uh it's like a it's just a moleskin okay. um a moleskin notebook and I'm, I'm writing down my tasks i'm writing down you know the projects that i have to do um, that's where a lot of my ideation and my sketching happens as well. So it's kind of like my one-stop shop for everything. Um, so I don't have like, I guess sometimes I write to-do lists in there as well, but mo I feel like most of it's just in my head. And sometimes, sometimes I'll forget something, but most of the time I'm, I'm very, um, on top of all the projects that I have going on. And so, but to, to carve out time for like your side projects and stuff, um, I don't know if I'm honestly, I'm going to just say this. I don't know if I'm the best person to talk about it because the past two or three years, I haven't had time to carve out side projects. I've, I've actually taken the past two or three years to more focus on myself um, because of my previous years in college of just burnout. I think I, I have a lot of like growth and stuff left to do. And I think that's perfectly fine. I think I've, 
I've uh, I've deserved this <laughs> this break, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, but when I was in school, I was just waking up earlier. You know, I would get up. I'm a morning person as it is, so I'd Same. get up at, at 5 a.m. and I'd start drawing and and doing my 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 um, my daily sketch at five in the morning. Um, and then, of course, staying up really late too. I would end up staying up until um, 11 or 12 some nights. Some nights, two or three, if the if the deadlines were coming up. And so, you know, that's I don't know if that's necessarily a healthy thing to do. I think it's just a matter of prioritizing your time. Um, you know, maybe instead, like what I do now is instead of playing video games or watching Netflix or whatever, maybe shut that off uh, two or three days out of the week and spend that time that you would be watching you know, working on your, your side hustle or whatever that thing may be. Well, and what I really appreciate about you two and your openness about this is mental health. Yes. Not only like a mindset to approach each day, like it, it, and positivity and operating from, you know, uh, uh, abundance, but mental yes. health, like how important is your mental health and what do you do to make time to take care of you first before you worry about anything else on your plate? Because yeah. mental health, having good mental health and even good physical health will then help you to thrive with whatever your creative right. suits are as well. Yeah, exactly. Because when I hit that burnout stage, you know, of course, I was so drained creatively, um, physically and every way possible. I couldn't I, I, barely, I barely could work. I was like some days I was crying in the mornings because I was just so uh, almost depressed because be I was like so burnt out. Overwhelmed and yeah. stressed as well. Exactly. Anxiety? Just, did you deal with anxiety all, as well? Yeah, all that stuff just sort of built up and I, I didn't I didn't feel it at the time until I hit this sort of breaking point of course. Um, <clears throat> but mental health of course now now knowing all of that it's it's a huge part of my my everyday practice in terms of, you know, now I do some meditation. I cycle every day to and from work so I get my physical activity in. I get my sort of mental clarity in. Um, when when do you meditate in the morning or at night? Both. So well, usually, usually right your, when I wake up. Your Headspace up, app, right? Yeah, I'm using Headspace for that, um, and that's been a lifesaver, especially. How, how long durations? Uh, I, I think it depends on the mood I'm in, because sometimes it could be five minutes, sometimes it could be ten. You know, as long as you're sort of just, I don't know, waking up with a clear head and then going to bed with a clear head, it sort of helps me sleep too, because I have a very <laughs> like overactive, imaginative uh, sort of mind. And I have like these fucking gnarly dreams. <laughs> like, the, <laughs> like the kind of dreams that you wake up and you're like, what the hell was that about? And it was like, it's the kind of dream that keeps me tossing and turning at night. And so meditation has honestly helped me sort of calm all of that down so that I can sleep better at night. And Mine's then of course- 10 to 15 minute at night. That's yeah. like helps me turn it off. Exactly. And I think that's, that's super imperative for me. Um, just in terms of just becoming um, sort of sane again, because the anxiety and the depression and stuff can set in at different times. I think, you know, from our discussions of like the health stuff that I went through a year ago. Yeah, you that, had a, a big life changing experience that kind of had some internal yeah, paradigm shift within you. Yeah, it was it was nuts. I, I feel like I've been or become a completely different person because of that event. Um, and we can get into that as well. But uh, Go for it, because I'm I'm a big believer in adversity is just like the bridge that you can bounce back from to take you on to like that next version of yourself you're supposed to become. That's it's right, not man. just it's not just taking an L and man, fuck it, you know that that's that, you know, back to yeah, you know, feeling sorry for myself, but it's like yeah. the spring, it's the springboard that's meant to help you get to that next step. Yeah, and that's what life's all about, honestly. Like you're trying to learn more about yourself as you you grow and as you age and um, this sort of health event um, that happened was that that sort of again it was it was kind of like my burnout I just hit a wall and you know a lot of a lot of it was mental um, but most of it of course physical as well um, but anyway I'll I'll set the scene um, <laughs> for everyone listening grab your popcorn had, yeah <laughs> grab your popcorn everybody <laughs> this is a good story uh, <laughs> now it's, it's kind of gross honestly so I'll just preface it with that it's kind of gross of course um, but I'm an open person, so I'm totally down to talk about everything about this process. Perfect. And so, uh, it was, uh, shortly after Thanksgiving or no, it was the day before to Thanksgiving. Um, I woke up, you know, went to the restroom as I normally do. And I had, I had blood in my stool and that was just the scariest moment in my life. Of course, I've never had, 
I think I've always been like a relatively healthy person. You know, every time I go to the doctor, they're like, oh, you're a great weight. You're a great height. Everything sounds wonderful. Get you're, out of you're here, perfect. kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'd just be like, you know, I'd always be in and out. Or like when I go to the dentist, they'd be like, oh, you have no cavities. I'd be like, wonderful, because I take care of my teeth. Yay. <laughs> so, uh, but then when this event happened, um, you know, I had to take my girlfriend to work. And I just remember like, you know, I'm driving in the car and I was just straight faced. I, cause of course I'm like thinking like, what the fuck's happening to me? What's Lost going in your on? Head. Yeah. I, I was internalizing everything. And of course my immediate reaction is like the worst thing possible. I got a little um, hypochondriac in me too. The same things happen with me. Yeah, man. And it's, it's, it's serious for me. Sometimes it hits me, it hits me real hard. Um, especially lately with the, Anyway, oh, that's another story. <laughs> uh, so, so that was happening, and you know, I went throughout the whole day just sort of contemplating what this could have been, and I, I sort of, I feel like I just instantly hit rock bottom. I thought the worst thing possible. I thought like, this is it. I'm dying. I don't know. I don't know why, but that was that was that was what my mind ended up doing. And so, uh, the first thing I did was I called my parents because I knew my my mom and my dad went through something similar and I was like, well, they're okay. Maybe I'll be okay too. And, uh, <clears throat> we, we ended up talking for a while. And of course I'm crying on the phone the whole time because I'm thinking the worst thing possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, my parents, I was crying so uncontrollably that my parents had to call the doctor for me because I could, I couldn't make any words out. So my, my parents called the doctor um, and luckily they somehow got me in the exact same day, which is a miracle. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I got in the same day and then, you know, of course they had to run their tests. That's disgusting too. So I won't get into it. <laughs> and, uh, they told me that my prostate was enlarged. And so, you know, and I'm thinking back to my, my grandpa, my grandpa had prostate cancer. Um, and so again, I'm thinking the worst thing possible. I'm like, Oh God, I'm going to die from prostate cancer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I spent I spent a long time crying. I spent a long time crying because I, of course, had no clue what the fuck this, what the fuck this was. Uh, and then, of course, I had lost my appetite. I wasn't eating. Um, I couldn't sleep. I was like shaking uncontrollably. I was just I was a freaking mess. I've never hit this point in my life. Even with the burnout before, it was nothing like this. It was it was like three times what my burnout was. Uh, and so. I ended up just like, I don't know. I, I, you know, of course took it one day at a time. I was like, okay, I need to, I need to eat something. So I'd force myself to eat a little something here and there. But, you know, of course with this event that happened, I'm thinking, oh, if, if I keep eating, am I going to keep pooping out blood? Essentially. <laughs> so, so I was, I was honestly scared. I was very fearful to even eat food, like something that's so common and necessary for the human body. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it. So of course I was losing weight and I'm already underweight as it is. I'm a skinny guy and I'm cycling all the time. I'm getting too much cardio as it is too. So I was losing too much weight and I lost like eight or nine pounds in the span of two weeks. Cause I had to go back for follow-up appointments cause they ran their blood tests that, you know, I had every test imaginable. I had to poop in a cup. I had to do all this disgusting shit uh, only to find out. Luckily, at the end of it, it was just because I was eating foods that I was allergic to. And I didn't know that I was allergic to these foods, I guess. <laughs> so, so everything's OK, uh, which is great. What kind of snapped you out of it? Was it getting that diagnosis? And then the, what, what flipped that switch in you like, hey, it's time to focus on my mental health not only, and physical health? Yeah, I mean, I think it was obviously hitting rock bottom. Like, I literally, I remember sitting outside over here. I was on the phone with my brother. I texted my brother, and I said, hey, man, can I call you? Because I needed somebody to talk to. And I, I remember having a conversation with him, and it was so funny. He was telling me, like, oh, yeah, I've been through that before. And I'm like, what the fuck? Why haven't you told me this? Like, it seems like it was this everyday occurrence for people. And then when I'm experiencing it, it's like life or death for me for some reason. It was just, again, it was a mental thing. Because obviously some people look at it and they're like, oh, it's nothing. Um, but for me, it was like this huge life event. And I, yeah. I just couldn't get over it. So, of course, I'm thinking to myself, well, this isn't normal. How do I fix this? 
Um, but I remember sitting on the phone with my brother and I even told him, I was like, I love you, man. And it's weird for me to say I love you to my brothers because we don't do that. Mm -hmm. I know, I know that's strange for some people, but we just, there's like a mutual love. We just never say it. But I remember getting off the phone. I told him I loved him because I literally thought I was dying. <laughs> I don't know what, why I reached this point, but, um, that it was just crazy for me. So, you know, getting, getting that sort of prognosis or, or them telling me like, oh, it's just the food that you're eating. All you got to do is stay away from this, this, and this. It was like, obviously it was a huge weight off my shoulders. Um, but at the same time, I was sort of left with this feeling of, uh, a constant feeling of fear. Um, and that's a terrible way to live. But even, I'm not going to lie, even to this day, I still have these sort of hypochondriac sort of fears. Um, Same and, here, you know, man. Whenever I'm having the, those sort of sensations or a symptom or, you know, if I have like, I'm like, I have an eye twitch and I've had it for two months. And of course, my instant think is like, my instant thought is like, oh man, I have a brain tumor. Great. This is it. Uh, <laughs> so even to this day, I still have those, those fears and I, I won't say that I've gotten over it. Honestly, I, I don't think I have. I've been more maybe at peace with it because I need to come to terms with the fact that, you know, at some point we're all going to die. And I think I, I know that, but I'm very fearful of that. Uh, like that's like my greatest fear is passing away. I don't want to, <laughs> uh, maybe it's because I'm not religious and I don't know you know, what's next, what's next? or yep. I don't, I don't know. There's like, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer for that. I haven't gotten over it. I'm still, I'm still stuck in this fear-based mindset to be honest. And I'm slowly working on it though. You know, I, I've been doing therapy. Um, I've been talking to a therapist using, um, oh man, what's it called? I'll have to get back to you on that. I think it's called like good help or something. It's an online resource um, where you can essentially just type in your symptoms, you know, get connected with a therapist online. So you don't have to like, that's awesome. You know, go find, you know, go searching for one in person. It's generally cheaper. Of course, you can ask for, um, you can ask for discounts and things if you're eligible for them. So anyway, uh, I haven't used it in a while. That's why I can't think of the the name. Cause I thought I reached a point where I was like, okay, I I'm feeling pretty good. And the therapist helped me, you know, and I've changed my diet. Um, I've changed like every product I've ever used. So, uh, the water filter I'm using, the toothpaste, the, the fucking shampoo on my head, more holistic in a sense, everything's very holistic. I'm a very, I was already raised in a holistic sense. Um, as you know, my mother has very much that direction. So she already raised me to be that way. Um, so it wasn't that hard for me to make the switch, which is kind of nice, but you know, there were some products that would have, you know, even my deodorant of course has like aluminum and all these, yeah. um, terrible things that shouldn't be rubbed all over your body. And so I've been making a lot of switches in that regard as well. So that way I can feel more at peace with the way I'm treating myself so that mentally I can be like, okay, you know, I'm doing the best I can. Um, and if I still somehow get sick or something, well, damn, you'll deal <laughs> with <right>. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something I admire is just the self-awareness you have at 25. Like, I feel like you're way ahead than where I was at 25 and I'm just really getting it now, especially at the age of 30, like in 2018 and 2019, I'm thinking so much clearly and accepting and embracing myself. But one yeah. thing you've really helped me with is my mindset. And I specifically remember sitting at Iron Bank at Creative South. And I was just speaking out loud some negative shit of just my jealousy to like you. And I think it was, oh my gosh, uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But you just told me, you told me, uh, you told me just, dude, stop being so fucking negative. Right. Yeah, and that's, it, that's it's been it. ingrained in my mind. And you've turned me on to books like E Squared from Pam Grout. And I talk about this yeah. in other episodes, but. Law of nice. attraction, like you grew up with your mom believing this too. What does this mean to you? Yeah. How are you able to manifest and create opportunities, especially how were you able to pay off your debt? These are the things that are woo-woo, that this is a perspective. <laughs> yeah. This is perspective yeah. podcast for a reason. This stuff yeah. has significantly changed my life. I owe much of my success over the last couple of years, what I feel is success to this new way of thinking. Yes, I talk that's about awesome. It. I love, yeah, man. Every and time I, you tell me a I new story, yeah. Every time you tell me a new story about like, 
I remember uh, when you slacked me a message and you said something about, hey, man, I just landed this gig with Apple. And it's so crazy that my son, we, you know, we just went, you just went to the doctor or something and your son was the size of an apple. And I was just like, what are the freaking odds? And, and my wife was telling us the, the weekend with all within a week. Uh, our son was the size of an apple with inside of her. She was freaking out, like, how are we going to afford this? How are we going to afford to build his room right now? Because we had to build a right. room with the house. And I'm like, don't worry. Something always comes up. I'm always able right. to take care of it. Something exactly. always is coming my way. And not even six days later, I get the project request from Apple. Oh, Unfortunately, the project didn't go through, but the first stages of it really helped us get the money that we needed yeah. for something. So, but, right. but I've never told that story to anybody publicly yet. Oh, sorry for but, spoiling no, the story. It's good. Honestly, I think it's perfect for this, but you yeah. really helped me crack this mindset of things. Like, so how were you able to pay off your debt? Yeah. So for me, um, just like your Apple gig, I was, I've always been thinking about the student loans that have been looming over my head for, you know, two or three years. The and burden, you could feel buried. Yeah, exactly. It, it was kind of just like even being in New York on top of all the payments that I was I was paying for rent and Internet and everything else. I had to pay my student loans. And so it was very hard to do all of those those payments all at once. Uh, and so I always just had this thought in the back of my head. I was like, damn, I'd love to pay off my student loans. And then uh, be, reading um, E Squared by Pam Groot, I was just sort of, uh, I guess, motivated again to sort of put her actions or put her put her words into actions into thoughts. And she has all those 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 uh, exercises that she has. Right. And so for me, it was kind of just uh, internalizing that, like, okay, I'm going to give myself this deadline. Like, I'm going to pay off my student loans next month. And then I would sort of think about that every single day. I'd wake up, and my first thought would be like, okay, somehow I'm going to pay off my student loans. I don't know how, but somehow I want to get rid of my. Like student in your loans. mindset, that's already your reality. Exactly. That's what it is. It, that's what her, her teachings are. You have to sort of uh, portray that this thing has already happened. Um, and I know this all sounds fucking nuts. Dude, the biggest, most successful people in the world all talk about this. They talk about meditation. If the right. most successful people in the world talk about this, there's got to be something to it. I agree. And honestly, at the end of the day, if you're still like super uh, skeptical of it, I don't think there's any harm in at least attempting to try it out because what's, what's you're the worst still, that can happen? Right. You, Otherwise, you're still a positive, like in a more positive mindset. Exactly. At the end of you're the on day, a, you're so. on a different frequency. You know, exactly. it's going to positively affect other people. Like, the, what's the worst that can happen? Right. Otherwise, just being negative right. about it, you're just going to stay in this this hole that you're in. Why not exactly, change man. something? Exactly, man. You get it. Uh, so yeah, I was sort of uh, in that sort of mindset, just thinking about okay, how do I get rid of these student loans? And then, you know, after a month of sort of really internalizing this and, and sort of portraying it into my reality, I get a email from uh, uh, VML, which is um, an advertising agency in Chicago, and they were contacting me about doing this job with Panama Tourism. And at the time, you know, I got the initial email and I was like quoting it out and they were like, hey, we need some lettering for this campaign. I was just like, yeah, sure, whatever. Because, you know, I send along estimates all the time. And most of the time, they don't go through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of the time, they'll come back to me. Actually, most of the time, they won't come back to me. They don't answer. Uh, I get they it. don't respond whatsoever. I'll, I'll even follow up and be like, hey, did you get that estimate? And then nothing. Uh, but anyway, I uh, sent along this estimate. And they, like, followed up within a day or two. And they're like, perfect, let's get going. And so I sent along this estimate. And at the time, I think that one estimate was for maybe two or three pieces of lettering. And so it was a pretty small gig. You know, it was can, like, you, can you give a, a price amount? Oh, yeah. I was, just, I was just about to. It was like, I think, two or three thousand bucks for, um, I can't remember exactly what I was pricing out. It was like two or three, essentially like, a, uh, like an initial sketching phase, just to see if I was capable of doing the work. So I think it was like two or three thousand bucks for the first gig. And, I, and I, they approved it. It worked out. Then they came back to me and they said, okay, this is great. We need 10 more. And then I sent out another quote. I think that quote came out to like, I don't know, it might've been around nine or 10,000 because they needed 10 pieces of lettering. Um, and then they, they were like, okay, perfect. Like the process for this project was just pure bliss. I sent along the stuff. They had no changes. It was, it was like approved right off the bat. And then we'd go on and do some more work. So it was amazing. This is very rare. Everything about this is very rare. Uh, and then they came back to me again. They said, okay, we have like 
I think it was like 15 or 20 more pieces. And then they needed another 10 or 20 more pieces that were in Spanish because this is for Panama tourism. So I had to do the, do the same work, but translated. So all in all, I ended up doing like 45 or so pieces of custom lettering. Some of them were quotes and phrases. Some of them were just one word or two or three words. Um, and I went through endless amounts of paper and stuff to do all the, the custom calligraphy. But by the end of this project, it was an $85,000 project. After I, after I finished everything, everything was said and done, I got paid. It was, just, it was insane. It was $85,000. My student debt at the time was uh, like 53000 or something from ASU. It was nuts. Um, and so I thought, you know, of course, I'm talking to my dad. I'm like, Dad, what do I do with all this money? Because, of course, I've never been paid anything close to this. This is a very rare opportunity. And, and uh, of course, my dad's like, oh, you should invest. And my dad's a business person. So he's Put like, it oh, in you Bitcoin. should invest it. I'm yeah. Just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, my dad would have said that. Yeah, <laughs> invest it in this and, like, you know, put it in stocks and stuff. And, and I kept thinking, like, yeah, I could do that and, of course, make more money in the long term. But then I thought, I just want to get rid of the student debt. Like, this is my my – my goal and my my sort of thing that I've been after for so long. What you and, asked for. Right. This is what I've asked for. And the, the, the opportunity presented itself. And I, you know, I, my dad was very, uh, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't very into this idea, but I told my dad, I was like, dad, I'm just going to pay it all off. I'm going to pay $53,000 off right now. I would do uh, the same. And so I called up, you know, Fed Loan Servicing and I was like, hey, is it possible to make a payment <laughs> in the, the amount of $53,000. And they're like, yeah, I don't see why not. And so I gave them my card or my bank info because I think they had to do a bank transfer or something. And then bam, it was done. I was just, it was a, a huge, huge weight lifted off my shoulders. I was just like, I can't believe it's gone. Uh, it was just amazing. But if, then of course I had like the 30,000 left over and I had to save that because I had to pay off yeah. all the taxes on that. Because of course I'm not getting, I'm not actually getting $85,000. Um, cause after taxes and everything you gotta else, push 30% minimum aside. Right. Exactly. So the 30,000 that was left over, oh, I had to pay a good majority of that to taxes the next year. So all that money's gone, but it was totally worth it because I feel great. <laughs> yeah. But it, the fact that you just had the mindset that this was coming, you asked probably out loud, a specific amount of money out loud. So that's the whole concept. If you, we'll wrap this section up, but Look yeah. into books like The Secret, but yep. Pam Pam Groot or Grout Groot. and E Square takes that to the next level. Yeah. It's not for everyone, but it could be for you. I was skeptical as hell, and it's changed my life. It's changed Scott's life. So, yeah. you know, and I continue to talk about this on the podcast. So, you know, if you want to learn more about this, hit me or Scott up. Um, yep. Real quick before we go to rapid fire questions, what's one piece of advice you give your past self when you were just starting off? Oh, man. Just take it easy. You know, similar to what you're like, you were talking about. Yourself? Yeah, exactly. What you were talking about earlier on about how you were comparing yourself to me and others around you, um, I was doing the same thing, but I was comparing myself to people that have been in the industry for 15 or 20 years, and I'm trying to reach that level. And so that's how I hit the burnout stage. And so I guess my, my piece of advice would be just, you know, take your time. Like it's a, it's a journey. It's, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, that sort of thing. And so it's okay for it to take time and it, and it will, everybody's career takes time. It's not just an overnight success. And I think in the age of social media, we sort of portray that it is an overnight success, which is very unhealthy. Um, but you know, if you guys scroll to the bottom of my Instagram feed, you can see all that, the, the past projects that I have done and that it has taken me, you know, at this point, it's been six or seven years to get to this point where I'm at now. So yeah, it takes time. It takes time. Dope. Anya, uh, when you're editing this, please pluck one of those for the the early nugget at the beginning. So, all right, all right. Moving to rapid fire questions. If you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? And this disregard any healthy <laughs> mindset that you're currently in. Okay? Uh, you're on death row. It does not matter. Dude, you're not here tomorrow. Hawaiian. Hawaiian pizza with pineapple. Somebody fight me about it. I love pineapple on pizza. I'm sorry. It it is. If it's for you, it's for you. If it's not, it's some not. People, some people get pissed about it. I know. It. Why do you care? I Why know. Yeah. Let let people uh, enjoy things. Right. Exactly. Let me enjoy my pineapple. I never got a chance really to dive into this one. I'm scrolling back up. Um, Real quick, tell us about what Brand Loyal is in this okay. new collective that you're a part of. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, after I was applying to 
for the Adobe Creative Residency last year. I got the in-person interview. I thought, oh, hell yeah, I got this. And then, you know, I got the rejection, which really sucks. I even then, thought you had it, man. Uh, I appreciate it. I thought yeah. I had it too, man. We were asking, we were attracting, but you know, I it doesn't know, always man. work that way. Right. That's all good. So, you know, uh, a week or two after that happened, my buddy Doug reached out to me and he's like, hey, Pen I'm starting Penick? to think. Uh, funny you should mention Doug Pennick. Okay. I actually just, no, no, but they, Doug Pennick actually lives right around the corner or at least close by to Doug Bell, who was the creative director at Kitchen Sink um, not too long ago. And uh, he was starting this new thing called Brand Loyal. Uh, it's essentially like a freelancer collective. So we've got uh, Doug's a designer, Alex Leipart is also a designer. Myself, uh, PJ Zabo does some film and video. We got Justin Zellers that does 3D architectural renderings. Um, and then we have uh, um, August and Andrew that are also other designers. And so we're doing like uh, a huge wide variety of projects from cannabis to architectural stuff. Um, and so we do a little bit of everything. Um, and that's how we sort of market ourselves to a lot of the uh, agencies and studios. And of course, just any client for that matter here in Phoenix that you know we are cutting the cost of the agency um the agency life because of course they take so much for all all their employees and everything else um and so we're trying to cut out the middleman and and do it ourselves and um you know after not getting the residency i was looking for that next step so brand loyal was the next thing he reached out and he said hey i'm starting this thing do you want to move into the Menorchid, which is a co-working space downtown and at that point, I was just like, fuck it. What have I got to lose? You know, I, I didn't have anything else going on. And I needed, I needed something to push me forward. And that was that thing. So we've been, we've been down in that space um, almost a year. Um, and it's been, it's been awesome. We've developed a lot of client relationships so far. I've worked on so many really cool local projects, which is very rare for me because a lot of my projects are, you know, New York or Chicago or San Francisco. Um, so it's great to be in the local scene and to be helping and seeing my work come to life. So that's been, it's been awesome. Dope. I'll be sure to link that up in the show notes uh, real yeah. quick. If you could have a, if you could have lunch with one person dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oh my God. Uh, Paul Rudd. I love Paul. Rudd. <laughs> We're watching <laughs> old friends episodes and Paul yeah. Rudd is in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like everything he does is for me, I love it. I just, he's just like pure comedic gold uh he's like i'm not gonna lie he's attractive as hell too all right it, man. <laughs> he's attractive as hell he's a good looking dude uh and he's just aging well too you know he's looking great in ant man <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I just love everything paul rudd and i think he'd just be a great dude to just hang out with and just have a conversation with script serif or sans serif script all my stuff is tending to lean to that script um <laughs> what's your favorite typeface overall or the one you've been vibing to the most lately uh oh Lord. man honestly anything james edmondson's making like True. blaze face uh obviously i've been loving obviously that he just recently recently released um that thing's massive but it can take care of everything you ever need so highly recommend everything james is making we're just writing that down for show notes um what's your guilty pleasure outside of design uh dude video games okay I knew that. I knew that, but not everybody else does. What's your yeah. favorite character or uh, story that you like to play? Dude, I mean, for me, I think you know. It's like it's. I've been playing Halo freaking three every day. <laughs> I'm obsessed with Halo three. Um, for those of you listening, I, I play the uh, Master Chief Collection, so it's not the original Halo three, but the remastered Halo three. So put your handle out there if you want to. Yeah, uh, set my soul on fire is on my Xbox username, so it's pretty close to you ring fire. I had to get him somewhat similar, uh, and so yeah, man, I've played like nine hundred and ninety one hours of Halo Three, which is actually pretty fucking disgusting. So <laughs> I'm not ashamed. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. It was a great nine hundred and ninety one hours. That was just last year, so it was pretty sweet. That's last year. Oh my god! And also, are you a big Zelda fan? Oh, huge Zelda fan. Oh okay, my god. I, I, I sell the two. Yeah. Everything okay. Nintendo, pretty much, too. Okay. Uh, where can people go to follow you and support you online? Dude, follow me on Instagram, uh, at you bring fire. Twitter, same thing, at you bring fire. It's all spelled out the uh, Y O U. Uh, 
Uh, I'm on Dribble, Behance, all the all the good stuff. I have the same username pretty much everywhere. And then and- you I was going to say, make sure you check out his website. It's just an awesome setup of how a portfolio should look. Everything, the user experience, it's fantastic. So well That's done it. on that. I know you put a lot of time into that shit, so I, I want did, to go yeah. check it out. So <laughs> thank I get some people that way. Man, thank you so much for just opening up, being transparent and graphic and sharing yes. pricing. <laughs> Everything above it is sincerely appreciated. I'm glad we were finally able to make this happen. We all appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. It's been a pleasure, honestly. Awesome. Cool. Um, We'll be in touch and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Take care, man. PC family, there you have it. The homie Scott Beersack, a.k.a. You Bring Fire. I know we got in some uncomfortable topics today, but that's what this show is about, is not just talking about all the highlights, but... You know, the obstacles and the adversity that leads people to success. And I want to share all of that. I want to share people's story. And Scott has an incredible story as well as incredible work. So please, if you found value in this episode today, do what you always do, which is go out and pepper and show him some love on his Instagram platform or wherever he's most active. Pretty sure it's Instagram. But Scott, thank you so much for opening up today and just shredding and melting our faces with value. We appreciate you, my dude. And I know we talked about some controversial topics too, about like the law of attraction. And for me, this has changed my life. I was that person who was stuck in a negative mindset for uh, 25-ish plus years. And this new way of thinking has really changed my life and opened up the floodgates for opportunities. So if you're stuck in this negative rut and shit's not happening for you, you know, what do you have to lose to try something different and think different? If the biggest most successful people in the world are all vibing out to this same message of how they approach their day with this mindset, there's got to be something to it. So I encourage you to get uncomfortable as well and start thinking differently. So if you're finding value in this and you're digging what you hear, here are a couple ways that you can support the show. The first is by backing the show financially at patreon.com slash perspective podcast. And the second way is by subscribing and leaving a rating review in Apple Podcasts slash iTunes. Not only is this going to help the show get discovered and climb up the charts in the design category, but it also allows me to give you a public thank you and some public love right here as Listener of the Week. This week's Listener of the Week comes from Mirsa Veli from USA, and they title this one Forever Hungry. And they state, I first heard of Scotty when he interviewed one of my favorite illustrators on Instagram, Michael Fugoso, aka Fugstrader. I instantly subscribed to his podcast and listened to them all when I need that extra motivation. I can relate to his struggles because I too couldn't find a job out of design school and still haven't, but I'm creating my own paths to success by designing and developing mobile games alongside my brother. I'm glad I found this amazing podcast. Again, thank you, Scotty. Miguel Sanchez. Miguel, thank you so much. That's all it takes. Take a few moments of your day to write a review. It can be shorter than that, and that puts you in a position to become a future listener of the week to get a shout out here. So thank you. I appreciate you. Also, make sure to subscribe to this channel, like the video if you dig what you hear, and I'm stoked to continue to produce this content moving forward. As I wrap things up, I got to give a huge shout out to my executive assistant, Paige Garland, my videographer, my video specialist. Uh, Colton Bacher, who's did all this magical work today to make me sound not so shitty. As well, I gotta give a huge shout out to my homie Bluka for all the dope theme music you hear on the show. You can find and support his music over at Instagram, SoundCloud, and Spotify at Bluka. That's B-L-O-O-K-A-H. And as you finish off this week strong, I want to encourage you to keep showing up, keep putting in the work, and keep creating. You got this. Thanks again for listening. It'd be awesome if you took the time to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and let the comment below so we can connect. Again, if you want to catch a shout out as a future listener of the week, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes and give it a rating and review.